Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a good week. Um, just a one reminder, don't forget today is, or tomorrow, I should say, is exam number four, chapters 10 through 12. Um, uh, if you have any questions concerning those chapters, I'm more than happy to go over any questions here in the beginning. Otherwise, I will continue with uh, chapter 14. And we'll probably finish that one today. Um, and then we open up the rest of the time to any other questions you may have. Uh, remember that I stated that, that this point forward, I'll basically be doing one chapter per Friday and then uh, and do that in the beginning of the, uh, uh, the uh, time that we have. And then the afternoon, uh, whatever time is left, we use it. It's opened up to any questions, not only for any questions concerning any of the chapters, okay? Get you ready for the final exam coming up. I believe uh, Canvas also updated everything. I think I got everything graded. The only thing I don't have is uh, a couple of stragglers, a couple of files, and they get through for, for my students. So if you need to uh, send me a file uh, through the, you can obviously through the assignment, but for whatever reason, you can't get it uploaded through the assignment. In the assignment, especially in the labs, you have a comment section you can upload it through there. And if that doesn't work, obviously send it to me uh, via uh, email, Canvas email, okay? Yes, do send, use Canvas email. Uh, use, using my regular email, uh, my uh, Scottsdale CCC or my GC, GCC email address, I don't check that as often as I do this one here. So it may be a while before I, I see that. So get it through Canvas email if you need to send me a question or send me a file. Okay, well, any questions, comments, concerns? Well, we're getting down to the wire. Semester is going to be ending fairly soon. I have a quick question, Dr. Fred. Yeah, so sure. Go, go ahead. I, I apologize because I know you've gone over the nomenclature of, um, many times, but mm -hmm. I took it last week. Okay. And I got 80%. So I know that was like the pass, like what the minimum you had to get. Yes. Does that translate to full marks? Like, should I keep trying to get more than 80% to get the full marks? Or is that 80% giving me that full 10%? Yes. That 80% is the minimum score. And so, yes, you're more than welcome to continue to go attempt to go above the 80%. Totally up to you. Uh, I have some students who are happy at the 80, we're done with it and move on. And I've had some that continue to try to kick it up into the 90, 95 percent percentile. Okay, uh, so if I keep practicing to get more, that will affect my grade? It, will it, it would improve it, yes, because Canvas is set up to uh, accept the highest score. For multiple attempts, it will keep the highest score. Okay, but I still like as a, if I leave it how it is right now. Will I still get full marks? Or well, you 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 you'll get the eighty percent of the full marks. Okay. Okay, and and that is worth ten percent of the overall grade. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify because I was thinking yeah. and I was reading the syllabus and I was like, oh wait, now I'm confused. So okay, okay. thanks for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. Because every every section, the, the homework is worth a certain percentage, as you know, the exams in the final exam, and um, whatever marks you get, if you get a hundred percent of whatever assignment you have, mm -hmm. if that is worth ten percent, then you get ten percent of that to the overall uh, score. Okay, and will it matter? So I took that before Sunday and I know you were saying we could get extra credit if we completed it by Sunday. If yeah. I go back into that now and get a higher mark, will that affect the date? Well, that I unfortunately the cutoff was, was last Sunday. Right. And so so if, gotcha. Yeah, so if you, I haven't gone in there to update everyone with the update of anyone who's got past the 80% of last Sunday. Uh, but uh, anything forward would be just the regular uh, uh, points that you get. Okay, so if I completed it before Sunday, I technically have the extra credit, but if I try now to get a better mark, 
I won't get that extra credit, but I might get the better mark. You're back, 100% okay. correct. Okay, and if I go back through old um, like homework questions and they've already kept my current score and I would just like to take it again to just, you know, as practice for the final exam. Yes. Will that mark up my grade or it, it won't? No, what it, what it does is, and, and it's, that's a good question here because the sum, you know, as you all know, the homework, you're allowed to attempt. And some students have just done one attempt and they got whatever score they wanted and they're good with it. But for some reason, after the due date, some students want to go back and take the second attempt, which is fine, you're more than welcome. But remember that uh, Canvas will treat it as the late entry, okay? Mm -hmm. So if your score is better in the second attempt, Okay, if you if you go back and do the second attempt and it's better than the first attempt, it will it will penalize you because it's late. Alert me and I will go back and correct that. Okay. If yeah, if for example your first attempt was eighty percent, mm -hmm. okay, and it's within the time limit and no no penalty, and then now you go back and do it and this time you get a ninety percent, but because it's late. Canvas treats it as a late and, and it drops to whatever, less than I think 50, 60%, okay? And you know that you did a 90% and you did your second attempt. And if that's the case, I could go back in there and, and get rid of the penalty and it'll get, give you the full 90% in your second attempt. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense for everyone? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's only for the ones that the ones the homeworks or assignments that you did on time, and there's no penalty if you did it after the time. Uh, it was late. I can't. I mean, I, I can't uh, correct that. But if you did it on time and you go back and do the second attempt, and you get a better score. I will get. I will remove the uh, the penalty. Okay. All right. Um, let me see what else. I do have an extra credit. I think most of you have turned that in. I've not graded yet, but I will have uh, maybe one more extra credit coming up, so we'll keep an eye out for it. Uh, let's see what else. I think I got covered. Any any other questions? I think I got everything covered. Yeah. I remind you, you're more than welcome to come to my Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we are uh, Tuesday and Thursday classes. They just got done with uh, chapter 13. So they're basically the same area, same chapter you're at. So you're more than welcome. Tuesday and Thursday, 3 to 4.15. Same link to get in there to give you a second, uh, second listening to the topics. Okay. All right. Uh, tutoring, if for some reason uh, you can't, the time that we have extra time after the, I've been talking about the chapter. If that doesn't work for you, let me know. Uh, we can set up a Zoom to do any uh, questions you may have. Uh, and also don't forget you got tutoring through SEC. Uh, so if you need access, you know, you know, get that help now. We got maybe five, five weeks left, I believe, somewhere around there. Yeah, we've got this week, one, two, three, four, and then the final is in the fifth week. So, you know, you got five weeks left, which includes today. And so uh, hopefully we'll get you prepared and you'll be all set and ready for the final exam. Okay? All right, any questions? All right. Okay, well, um, you might hear my family in the background. Hopefully it's just too loud, let me know. They just came in from California, so uh, I'm happy to see them. So if it gets too loud, let me know. I'll tone, tone it down a little bit. <laughs> okay, guys, let's start then. There's no further questions. I'm starting with Chapter 14, which deals, uh, with, deals with, with uh, horses, okay? Specifically, what we call intermolecular forces. Now. The term, the prefix inter, I-N-T-E-R, versus the prefix intra, slightly different, okay? The prefix intra, I-N-T-R-A, versus the prefix inter, okay? 
So we can see here that we're talking about molecular forces. These are interactions that deal with the molecule, okay, with the compound. These interactions can be interactions that deal with other molecules. So molecule A is interacting with another molecule A, okay? And that is what we talk, when we talk about inter, I-N-T-E-R. This is when molecule A is interacting by some force with another molecule of A, okay? And it could be a different molecule, but we're gonna keep it with A versus A. Okay, so this is an intermolecular interaction. When we talk about what is called intra, we are talking about the forces within A, whatever that compound A is, the forces that keep that molecule intact. What is holding that molecule together? Are they covalent bonds? And if they are covalent bonds, and here we go back to covalent bonds, remember that? Covalent bonds are, are that sharing of electrons between two non-metals. Non, um, uh, atoms that are non-metals. And what is holding those, that, those forces within the molecule, be it a covalent bond, and with that being, is that a polar covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond, okay? Or could it be an ionic bond, okay? So intramolecular forces versus uh, intra versus inter. Now there's, of the of the it forces that interact, the intermolecular forces, those forces with other molecules, there's only uh, actually four, four types of forces. Okay, and we're gonna go through it. What we need to grasp when we deal with this topic, we have to go back and look at that molecule and determine, well, is that molecule covalent or is it ionic? Okay, now once we know that, and then we need to determine is that molecule, if it's, if it's ionic, it's one, one function, we're one force. But if it's, if it's covalent, it's a covalent bond, we have to then determine is it polar or is it nonpolar? Okay, so that brings us back to uh, the shape. Remember, we talked about the shape because you could have polar bonds. Remember, recall this you could have polar bonds within the molecule. But because of the geometry of that molecule, those polar bonds may cancel out, resulting in the overall nonpolar property of that molecule. And if the polar bonds do not cancel out, then we end up with a polar property of that overall that molecule. Okay, so let's see how it's all tied in back to what we, we dealt with the polar bonds, nonpolar bonds, the geometry and so forth. So now we're gonna bring it all together. Because once we identify what force, what inter IMF is, 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 is um, in that molecule, we can do compare and contrast, okay? Now we can do absolutes saying that this thing has a volume point, for example, or whatever degrees, we can't do that, but we can compare molecule A versus molecule B. Okay, so, and based on the intermolecular forces that would tell us that, that, for example, molecule A could have a higher boiling point. Okay, and that is that temperature in which that molecule starts to boil, convert from a liquid phase into the gas phase. And we, we have a variety of different boiling points for, for compounds. And it's all related, when we think about this, it's all related at, by how these molecules are attracted to each other. Let's think about this for a second. If we have this interaction here that I draw with a zero point into this dotted line, which represents an interaction between two molecules of A and B. If that interaction is strong, it's gonna take a lot of energy to break that up, to break up that interaction, to separate it, okay? And so that means that it will require a higher temperature to get enough energy to break up the interaction and it could be in the liquid phase and, then, and shove it into the gas phase. And the same is true of itself. Okay, so the stronger the interaction, the higher the energy. So that means that we can compare A and B, molecule A versus uh, molecule B, and based on the intermolecular force associated with either A, a and B, that would tell us who's gonna have a higher boiling point. 
Okay, that's one physical park. We can we can do a, an educated guess on, as to who has a higher volume point. And other, and there's three other physical properties such as surface tension, viscosity, okay? Other things that we can do compare and contrast, okay? Simply based on looking at that molecule, determine its polarity, okay? And from that information, determine what IMF interaction is involved there. And from that information, be able to do a relative comparison between two different molecules and compare different properties, but specifically we'll be dealing with four physical properties. Okay. And all of this, all of this, if we think about it, is related to these crazy electrons. These electrons, remember, are on the outside of the molecule. They, you know, they're outside. That's what, what, what's, what's interacting in here is, is these electrons that are interacting with other molecules. Right? It's not the protons, not the nucleus. It's on the outside surface, the, the outermost shell, the valence shell, that is causing this interaction with other molecules. These crazy electrons have a lot of, lot of, uh, um, effect on properties of, of chemical compounds. So we have IMF, intermolecular forces. So it, here's a diagram, basically what I just stated here. We've got two diatomic molecules, okay? And here on this, let me draw a different color here. We have this in, interaction drawn here by the dotted line between two different or two of the same in this case, diatomic molecules. That is the intermolecular forces between molecules. Compared to inside the molecule, and we're, we're looking at the bond within the molecule, and depending what that molecule is, that bond, what type of bond that is, that is the intramolecular forces, okay, within the atoms. Now, Intermolecular forces hold molecules together relative to each other, whereas intramolecular forces hold the actual uh, uh, molecule within itself together. Okay, so go back and review your polar and nonpolar bonds and molecules and why certain things are polar, why certain things are nonpolar. Okay, as a general guideline to refresh your memory is when we have a polar bond, whenever you have nonpolar bonds, all nonpolar bonds, the net result is that molecule is nonpolar, okay? Whenever you have polar bonds, in general, those compounds are polar, except when those polar bonds cancel each other out. Recall that we had the molecule that we looked at was carbon dioxide, okay? And there was a polar bond between carbon and oxygen going, in this case, the, into the right direction. Because why? Because oxygen had a higher electronegativity, okay? Remember the measurement of EN. Go back and refresh your memory about electronegativity. That is the affinity to pull electrons onto itself. Fluorine, we use the periodic table to determine who's more electronegative than relative electronegative within comparing two different atoms. And we use fluorine as our benchmark because in the periodic table, fluorine was up top right corner here. That's the most electronegative element. And the trend was from left to right, it increased and from bottom to top, it increased. Okay, so if we're comparing say carbon, which is about right here in the periodic table and oxygen about right here, we don't have to memorize the, the electronegativity because each electron, each atom has an absolute electronegative value, and that's not necessary to memorize it each one. But all we got to do is, is find this position relative to fluorine, and oxygen is a lot closer to fluorine than carbon, which tells you oxygen is a lot more electronegative, which tells you that the dipole arrow goes from carbon to oxygen because oxygen is pulling the electrons onto itself much greater than carbon is, okay? And the same is true in the other direction, all right? And so that results in a partial negative. Remember that partial? 
partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive on the carbon. So uh, with oxygen being a lot more electronegative, it's pulling the electrons onto itself, kind of stripping the electrons away from carbon, resulting in less electron density, which results in, in more of a positive character on the carbon. And the same occurs in the opposite direction, where you got a <coughs> excuse me, partial negative on the oxygen and another partial positive on the carbon, okay? Now, we have that results in when you have two different atoms, and I'm going through a lot of this refresh your memory here, when you have two different atoms, in general, you can say I've got a polar bond, okay? Except, remember, when you have a carbon-hydrogen bond. Remember that, we talked about that. Because the electronegativity of carbon hydrogen is essentially the same, carbon hydrogen is treated as a nonpolar bond. Okay? That means that all the other bonds that are two different nonmetals are polar automatically. And then, depending on their position on the credit table, it tells you who's more electronegative, which then tells you which direction the dipole arrow goes which tells you which is the partial negative and the partial positive. Okay, now with all that said, we got two polar bonds on carbon dioxide and you would think, okay, polar bonds, two of them, I got a polar molecule. But these arrows, I've also talked about this, are what we call in mathematics, I guess, vectors. Vectors are nothing more than uh, mathematical units, values that have both a value and a direction. All right, so that arrow is going from left to right in the, let's say, the easterly direction, whereas the other arrow is going in the westerly direction. It has a, a magnitude defined by the length of that arrow. We can, just by visual inspection, we can see that the arrows are going in opposite direction. And so we can very visually say they cancel each other out. We can do this mathematically, but we're not going to do that. We're just using the visual technique. So those arrows cancel each other out. So the, the dipole of each bond, the net result, they cancel each other out. So the net result, carbon dioxide, is an overall nonpolar molecule. Okay. Now, if I were to change one of those oxygens and use sulfur, you might think, oh, okay, why wouldn't the same thing happen here? But the difference is this Th this carbon dioxide would be nonpolar because the bonds cancel out. In the, the, the one where we substitute a sulfur, it will be polar. Why? Because yes, each arrow go in opposite direction, but the magnitude, the length of that arrow is different than for the carbon and the oxygen versus the carbon and the sulfur. Okay. The magnitude is different because it's a different atom. Okay. Sulfur. Resulting that even though they cancel out, this one on the left may be, let's say, six units. Okay, and the one on the right may be five units. Okay, a polarity. I'm giving you arbitrary units. The result is, you know, six minus five, we still got one unit of the resulting in the overall polar molecule. Okay. The other time was the tetrahedron, where, and then draw the tetrahedral configuration, kind of draw it, and we have. Um, I'm going to say X here, where it's a different molecule attached. Unless it's hydrogen, if it's hydrogen all the way around with the four on the four bonds, automatically nonpolar, automatically nonpolar molecule. But if sent, if it's anything else, it can be polar or nonpolar. If X are all the same and it's all the way around, the geometry is such that even though we got polar bonds, four polar bonds. The geometry with tetrahedral is that they cancel each other out, so resulting in a nonpolar molecule. If I were to change one of those x's and replace it with, let's say, y, 
something different than X, still a polar molecule, carbon Y is still polar. Let's assume that X and Y is a little more like a negative in carbon. And so we might think, okay, we got a, a non-polar molecule. But again, in this case, the three axes will cancel, but the Y would not. There will still be a net result of polarity. So in this scenario, we will end up with a polar molecule. Okay, so go back and refresh your memory and how we determine whether a molecule was polar or nonpolar. And remember that geometry plays a big factor here. All right, so a lot of information. <laughs> All right, so I did a real quick rehash on, on, uh, on polarity of what we talked about in the past. All right, so let's take a look at the um, hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride, depending on whether it's gas or aqueous, but HCl, okay? We have a polar molecule, obviously, between hydrogen and the chloride, two dissimilar atoms. So it is polar, okay? Because the chloride is a lot more like a negative than hydrogen. And then we can look at the, um, the interaction, the intermolecular forces of HCl, and that's molecules interacting with other molecules of HCl denoted by that dotted line right here. Okay. Those crazy electrons are, have a very strong effect. I'll give an example. I'm sure you've done this before. I'm sure you've seen it done before. You take a balloon. Okay, blow up a balloon. Rub it on your head. I wish I had a balloon here. I'll show you. Rub it on your head, right? And you know, your hair, we are all covered with electrons all around us. Don't believe me, walk on some carpet for a little bit and touch some metal. You get a nice little zap, okay? So we rub that balloon on our head. We are in effect transferring electrons from your head to the surface of the balloon. Now, if you take that balloon and you put it on your chest, does it not, doesn't it stick, okay? If it doesn't, you rub it, rub it on your head a little bit longer, transfer some more electrons, and you put it in your chest, it sticks. Now you might ask, well, what's going on here? Why does it stick? Okay, do we got some magical Harry Potter stuff going on here? No, we don't. What, what is happening is you have transferred those electrons, the negative charge, onto the balloon. As you bring it to your chest, remember your body, every, all, everything around us has electrons. Some of them are bounded, some of them are loose on your body. As you bring that heavily charged negative balloon to the surface of your body, it's going to repel the electrons on the surface of your body, pushing the electrons into your body or away from the balloon because it's negative. Negatives and negatives are going to repel. Right? The result is it leaves a partial positive surface on your chest, which then attracts the negative, partial negative of the balloon and the balloon interacts, they interact and they, and it catches it. And, they, and they're not gonna sit there forever, it's very weak. But those are those electrons um, and you demonstrating there I'm trying to describe power you know, of electrons that, what it can do, okay? Anyway, um, most molecules have a permanent dipole, for example, HCl, okay? HCl here has a permanent dipole because the two atoms are dissimilar, different electronegativity. It's built into the molecule. Other molecules do not have a permanent dipole. It is induced, it is created. The nonpolar molecules don't have a permanent molecule, a permanent uh, dipole. They have no dipole. They've all been, you know, there's no dipole there, okay? The, the electrons are equally shared, but they can induce a dipole, just like the example of the balloon I just demonstrated, talked about, okay? And we're going to learn that these temporary dipoles do exist for nonpolar molecules, but they're temporary and they're weak. 
their weak interactions. Okay, so there are four types of intermolecular forces. Okay, and this is between molecules and this is due to the, the partial positive and the partial negative area of the molecule. The first one is called the London dispersion forces, which by the way, are the weakest of the four forces here, okay? And furthermore, they only occur for non polar molecules, okay? And so whenever you look at a molecule, the structure, and you determine that it is nonpolar overall, the only intermolecular force those molecules have is this one here, London dispersion forces, okay? All right, second type. Second type is what are called the dipole-dipole forces, very similar to the HCL we just showed, we have, first of all, all of them, the criteria is that the molecules have to be not polar, okay? That's the criteria. Now, if we look at the example of HCl, we have that interaction between HCl and HCl molecule, okay? We have a dipole here, do we not? We have a dipole going to the, to the direction of HCl. And we have one over here. Well, remember, this is the partial negative, the arrow is, and here's the partial positive on the other molecule. Well, we got a negative, partial negative, partial positive. What's going to happen? There's going to be interactions. There's going to be an attraction there. And you can imagine here, I only showed it to you, uh, two, you know, one, two dimensional here, but this is, we live in a three dimensional world. So this is happening in all dimensions. These interactions can be pretty strong. And so criteria number one to have a dipole-dipole force is this. They gotta, they gotta be polar, okay? A nonpolar molecule cannot have a dipole-dipole force, okay? Straightforward. And the same is, the same is true for the other. A, a polar molecule cannot have London dispersion forces, okay? Now, Having said that, I can also say that within a molecule, a certain section, a certain area can have a dipole, whereas another area can have a London dispersion force. So it is feasible to have both within the molecule, depending on the structure of the molecule. All right, so now that's the second one. So it's a little bit stronger than the London dispersion forces. Now we have the third type. The third type is called the hydrogen bridging force. They also used to call it uh, hydrogen bonding. Okay, that was a, you may see it in some literature also labeled as hydrogen bonding. They try to stay away from the term bonding because it's not a true bond. It's an interaction between the molecules just, just like I showed here with the HCL. All right, so hydrogen bridging force is nothing more than a dipole-dipole force, but has an additional little oomph to it. Because it's only for those um, compounds that have, uh, first of all, a hydrogen bonded to a fluoride. I call this NOF, it's called NOF, not on file. <laughs> it is for hydrogen that is bonded to fluoride, a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, or a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, okay? Only for those examples, type of bonds, do we have what is called a hydrogen bridging. Yes, HF, HO, HN is a dipole force, but it's a special dipole force and has an additional to it is a, for lack of a better word, it's a little bit stronger interaction, okay? And we call that hydrogen bridging force, but only for HF, HO, HN, okay? So with respect to strength of these three, London dispersion forces are the weakest. The strongest is our 
is the hydrogen bridging force, and then the dipole dipole is an intermediate someplace. Okay. So I'm hoping that you can start seeing here. If in fact hydrogen bridging is the strongest, and London dispersion forces is, are the weakest. I'm hoping you can see something. You can interject some conclusion. Is this that if I'm trying to boil a liquid, a two different liquids, and one of them happens to have hydrogen bridging forces because they determine that based on the structure, and the other one happens to have London dispersion forces. You can reasonably conclude that the one with hydrogen bridging force is going to take a higher temperature to boil than the London dispersion forces. Why? Because the hydrogen bridging forces, the interaction between the molecules, is stronger. So it's going to take a lot of the energy to break up that interact the interaction between molecules, so they can break apart from going from the liquid to the gas phase. The London dispersion force being the weakest, you were going to learn that you know it doesn't take a lot of temperature, not at all. Sometimes it's just room temperature is going to cause it to go into the uh, um, into the atmosphere. Okay, and we'll find that a lot of uh, compounds that are are in the, that exist in the gas phase that you know at this temperature, ambient temperature, some temperature and pressure, they exist as gases because they have nothing but London dispersion forces. And so the molecules are not interacting with each other very strongly. Whereas you have hydrogen bridging force where interactions are very strong. Water is a liquid in, a, in this you know, ambient temperature and atmosphere. Whereas butane, think about this, butane is a gas. Propane is a gas. Okay. Those guys, hydrocarbons are, are nonpolar. And the only force that's interacting with them are London dispersion forces. Okay? We can make butane and we can um, um, make propane into liquids, but it takes energy to put them into a pressurized container. You know, now we've got, got them into liquid, but as soon as you let them out to the atmosphere, they are gaseous. All right, so that being said, the last force we have is called the ion dipole force. Now, the criteria for this is what? We have an aqueous system, inter aqueous AQ, and then it's an ionic compound. Okay. And it's simply, that's it. If we have an ionic compound, hence let's say sodium chloride and a aqueous system, obviously which would be water. The only force involved there is ion dipole force. Water has a dipole force. The ion has to be ionic. And so essentially number four is kind of on its own, own plateau. We can't really use number four to compare and contrast one, two, and three, okay? So once we notice that it is uh, ion and it's an aqueous system, then we have no other forces involved there other than ion dipole forces, okay? So those are the four forces. Any questions so far? All right. All right, now, London dispersion forces. These are pretty much temporary. And they're analogous to that example I utilized or talked to you about with the balloon and the and, uh, and, and, uh, transfer of electrons, okay? Now, when one molecule, first of all, they have to be nonpolar molecules, point number one, okay? And being nonpolar, uh, again, once you're nonpolar, the only force involved here are London dispersion forces, and these forces are temporary. And essentially, we have one molecule coming in close to another molecule, and it's going to, the electrons are going to push the electrons away, resulting in a partial negative and a partial positive area, which causes that interaction. But like I stated, the interaction is very weak, and it's, it doesn't last very long. Most of the time, 
uh, you'll find that these guys, these compounds are gases. These forces are extremely weak and very little attraction, simply because the gas molecules are so far apart from each other relative to being in the liquid phase, relative to being in the solid phase, okay? Okay, now, one key point, if we're comparing within nonpolar molecules, we can do a comparison with within and, and determine, well, who will have a, let's say, higher boiling point? Well, if I'm comparing, say, carb, a, a hydrocarbon with three carbons versus a hydrocarbon with 10 carbons, they're both nonpolar, they both have London dispersion forces, but I can take a further prediction and say the one that's a bigger molecule are gonna have more electrons and therefore more London forces and therefore more stronger um, uh, interactions and therefore their property changes, okay? It is analogous, analogous to a certain extent if we compare, and you're familiar with this, if you look at vegetable oil, vegetable oil is made up of nothing but hydrocarbons. It's a nonpolar species. It's an oil, nonpolar. Does not dissolve in water. Okay, try it at home. You'll see it doesn't. Okay, very nonpolar. But there are other uh, compounds out there, like for example, butter. You know, in in the in the room temperature, it's solid, right? It will melt with time, but it's solid, and so. Those interactions between the molecules of butter, which also are made up of hydrocarbons, just happens to be a little bit bigger hydrocarbons, there's more force there. So their property is more of a solid at the same temperature as compared to vegetable oil at room temperature and it's the liquid. Okay. So bigger nonpolar molecules contain more electrons and therefore uh, more London forces. Okay. And this kind of shows, demonstrates between nonpolars that come together, generate these black dots or represent electrons, okay? Uh, electrons, you know, they're negative charges that come together, close together, they're gonna repel each other, right? And forming these temporary uh, negative, partial negative and partial positive areas. So this interaction can occur very analogous to the balloon example I utilize with electrons being transferred onto the surface of the balloon only to uh, be held on. That balloon can hold on to your chest for a short period of time, okay? All right, so uh, dipole dipole forces, like priority number one, they must be polar molecules, okay? And they have a permanent dipole. Nonpolar molecules do not have a dipole and do not have a permanent dipole. Polar molecules do, okay? Resulting is in a permanent partial negative area and a partial positive area, which then, because it's permanent, it will interact right here, okay? Good. So far, so good. Here's my right? All right. Okay. Now, obviously, as I stated, dipole dipole forces are stronger in London forces. And criteria number one, they must be polar molecules. And so, again, can overemphasize going back and refresh your memory on how to define what is polar, what is nonpolar. Okay, the hydrogen bridging force, very unique dipole force. Like I stated, it, it is a dipole force and that is correct, but because of its uniqueness, it's got a little bit more interaction, a little more strength. You're very polar, okay? And it only pertains to hydrogen bonded specifically to a fluoride or oxygen or a nitrogen, hence the NOF, okay? Very strong interaction. It's so strong that, you know, water, its temperature to boil, the boiling point of water is, is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit. It's fairly, it's fairly high, you know. And when you are, we're going to learn this here, here in a bit. And when we are 
hitting it with some heat, what we're doing is, is breaking up that interaction. And it takes a lot of energy to break that interaction so that the liquids go away from being in the liquid phase to into the gas phase. Okay. All right, so there's a three-dimensional model here in the far right to kind of demonstrate that this interaction is occurring, you know, all around three dimensions, x, y, and the z axis. So these forces can be very, can and are very strong. Okay. Uh, uh, hydrogen bridging forces are stronger than the dipole, which are stronger than the London dispersion forces. Okay. But they're not a bond. Okay. That's, that's the important part to remember. They're not a true bond. When we look at ionic bonds and covalent bonds, remember ionic bonds, we got a full charge. We got sodium and chloride. We got a full positive charge, a full negative charge, two strong magnets coming together, strong interaction. You know, we call that ionic bond. Even though it's not a true bond, we're sharing electrons like covalent compounds. Remember covalent compounds, it is the sharing of electrons we're literally forming a bond and sharing a pair of electrons. Now we're gonna have equal sharing or unequal sharing. If we have equal sharing, then it's a nonpolar bond. If we have unequal sharing, then it is a polar bond, okay? But we have a bond. Right. Okay, um, the ion dipole forces, well, that's the interaction between an aqueous system, okay? Which is responsible, which is uh, responsible for the dipole part. Even though it's aqueous H two O, and we're dealing with hydrogen bridging forces, it's still a dipole. Okay, so if we look at this molecule, uh, uh, molecule of water interacting with the ion of sodium, you know the water, the oxygen has a big old partial negative charge, and here we got the sodium with a, a full fledged, full fledged positive. A charge, and we have all this interaction occurring here between the water molecules and the sodium ion. Now, on the other end, if this was, let's say, sodium chloride, the, the chloride part will be interacting with the partial positive part of the sodium, you see? So you can see this big old matrix, if you will, uh, of the material. And it's, and it's, a, it's a, a very strong force, very strong force. All right. Okay. So let's let's summarize some stuff so we can you know, get them confused. For example, when we're dealing with actual bonds, we are dealing with intra I N T R A intra force intra molecular forces. Okay. And that is the forces within the molecule, within what's holding the molecules together. Obviously, we have ionic bonds where we have a metal and a non-metal coming together. A metal with a full positive charge and a non-metal with a full negative charge. And of course, we have covalent bonds of which we have two types, polar covalent bonds, where we have an unequal sharing of atom, electrons, excuse me, between uh, two different non-metal atoms, okay? And then we have a nonpolar covalent bond where we have equal sharing of uh, electrons between the same non-metal atoms or carbon hydrogen, okay? So all of the diatomics, obviously, would be would have nonpolar molecules, and anything with carbon hydrogen would be a nonpolar bond, I should say. That molecule. So that is what's holding. That is those are the intramolecular forces. The intermolecular forces is what is how the molecules are interacting with other molecules of itself. And so we have the London dispersion forces criteria criteria number one. They must be nonpolar. 
As soon as you define a molecule and determine that it is nonpolar, that's all she wrote. The only force involved there is, is the London dispersion property. Okay. Um, and if it's not nonpolar, then it's got to be polar, right? Assuming, when I said assuming, that the polar bonds don't cancel out. Okay. Because if the polar bonds cancel out, if the polar bonds cancel out, then you have a nonpolar molecule. So if you have a polar molecule, you have the dipole-dipole forces. Then you have the hydrogen bridging forces, which are dipole-dipole forces, but it's a little bit extra. And those are uh, the bond between nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and fluoride hydrogen. So on, only under those conditions, they have what the major force is, the hydrogen bridging force. And then finally, you got the ion dipole force, which deals with uh, majority of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, that deals with an aqueous system and a, an ionic compound. Okay. So this kind of summarizes the forces, the inter and the intramolecular forces. All right, so, well, first thing's first. Oh, somebody had a question? I got, I got somebody's, uh, uh, somebody got unmuted. It, was there a question? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what we have here is a table. Okay. And the table says, is asking you to do indicate the strongest type of IMF in the samples of these molecules. Okay. And so what we do is what they've done is they've given you the molecule okay, on the first column. And then from that molecule, you have to determine whether it's polar or nonpolar. And then what that tells you is once you determine that, you can answer the last column, okay? Now, to determine whether it's polar or nonpolar, you may have to revert to the Lewis dot structures. Okay, I had a question here. Oh, I had no problem. Okay. To determine whether a molecule is nonpolar or polar, you may need to divert to revert to the Lewis dot structure. Remember the Lewis dot structures when we added up the valence electrons for all of the atoms con con uh, contributing to the whole molecule. From that, we're able to, you're always told who the central atom is, then we start putting all the molecules attached, making bonds and so forth until we come up with a structure. From that, we have a general formula Okay, A, B, E, remember that general formula? A is the central atom, B is how many atoms are bonded to the central atom, and E was how many lone pair of electrons were bonded to the central atom, okay? Once we had that information, we went to the shapes table. The shapes table then told us based on the A, B, E general formula, the geometry, okay? And once we know the geometry, and we knowing that you know we got polar bonds, we can determine whether any of the polar bonds canceled out. And if none of them cancel out, we got a polar molecule. Okay. So it's all tied in together here, you know, from what we talked about to where we at now. Now we talked at length about carbon dioxide. And if you recall, once we we determined the, uh, I mean, once we had, we had carbon, two oxygens, and we came up with the following structure. Okay, something like that, which is linear. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pairs of lone electrons. And that one there, uh, we needed to create double bonds. You know, you create double bonds or create triple bonds until such point that the octet has been fulfilled by everybody. All right. We know that carbon oxygen is polar. It's a polar bond and it's and we know that the uh, 
oxygen is a lot more electronegative than carbon, and therefore the arrow goes from left to right, to the right direction, and it also goes from right to left, okay? That also tells us that polar bonds cancel out. So we have polar bonds, okay? We have polar bonds, but they cancel each other out, resulting in a nonpolar species, okay? Which automatically, once you determine that, it is nonpolar, the only force associated with that is the London dispersion force. You don't need to go any further, okay? All right. Now, the next one would be trifluoride, phosphorus trifluoride. If you go through the Lewis dot structure, you will find it to be very similar to ammonia. And you'll end up with this particular structure there, okay? If you recall, when we were doing these Lewis, Lewis dot structures, I stated that whenever you end up with a lone pair in the central atom, automatically think polar bond, regardless of what else is going on, okay? That was a kind of a tool to help you out. But you can go through the geometry and you notice that, that you have a polar bond between the fluoride and the phosphorus. In fact, you got three of them. Let me change the color on this so we can distinguish. We have a dipole going from the phosphorus to the fluoride, okay? Phosphorus to the fluoride because the fluoride is the most electronegative, the most electronegative element. So it's going to the fluoride. So we can say that we got a partial negative on the phosphorus, partial positive on, excuse me, partial positive on the phosphorus, partial negative on the fluoride. And we do that for all three bonds. And you would think, okay, maybe these bonds cancel each other out. But remember, the lone pair occupy a lot more space because we've got two electrons that are repelling each other. So they push these fluoride phosphorus bonds into each other. The result is that the, the three dipoles do not cancel out, okay? Do not cancel out because the lone pair of electrons show very, if those electrons and the lone pair of electrons did not do that, you would have a tetrahedral geometry and, and being in tetrahedral geometry, they will cancel each other out. And therefore you end up with an ounce of molecule. But it doesn't happen that way because the lone pairs occupy a lot more space and you don't have the, the tetrahedral configuration resulting in a polar molecule, okay? Now, once you realize it's a polar molecule, you have two choices. Obviously you don't, it's no, long, no longer London's dispersion forces. So you have to select, I'm gonna go through this systematically. We can eliminate London forces because it's polar, okay? We can eliminate the ion dipole forces because there's no ions involved here. There's no ionic compound. So the only two choices you got left to select is either the dipole dipole or the hydrogen bridging force, right? That's what you got left. Now, can it be the hydrogen bridging force? And the answer is no. Why? Because it only pertains to those two hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. We don't have hydrogen involved here at all whatsoever. So we can eliminate the hydrogen bridging force and the only logical selection would be dipole dipole. Notice how I did that systematically. Okay, stepwise until such point you're comfortable with going directly to the answer, but initially, Go through the steps, okay? Determine its polarity. So that means that this molecule is, let me clear this mess up a little bit, its strongest force is the dipole dipole forces, okay? All right. Now, number two, here's the thing you should hopefully recognize almost immediately. One, you got a fluoride sitting there, okay? First of all, you, you recognize there's two different elements, two different elements involved here. Automatically, it's polar, no questions asked, unless it was carbon hydrogen, which we don't have there, right? So we know automatically it's, it's polar, okay? Just by virtue of being two different elements. Second of all, okay, 
recognize that you've got fluoride there. And guess what? You got hydrogen there. That means that you're going to deal with hydrogen bridging forces. Okay? Yes, it's a dipole, but it's that special case where you got hydrogen bonded to fluoride. So you're dealing directly with hydrogen bridging forces. Okay? Move forward, hydrogen bridge force. Okay. Finally, we have CH4. Well, we, we can go do the geometry that may help you to come up with tetrahedral, but I'm hoping here that you can recognize right away that you are dealing with hydrocarbons. It's a molecule that has nothing but carbon and hydrogen. So with that being said, boom, what we have here is a nonpolar molecule. Okay. All, we got four bonds, all carbon hydrogen, all nonpolar, which means the only choice you have is hydrogen bridging force. Okay. Hydrogen bridging force. The thing to remember about carbon hydrogen is treated as a nonpolar bond. Okay. And therefore you have London, London bridges. The last one. Okay, it is ionic and polar water. Okay, we've got potassium iodide, which is an, an ionic compound. It's AQ, aqueous. So the only logical IMF here is the ion dipole. Okay. Okay, now. With this information, can anybody predict, excluding the KI, just looking at the first four compounds, which one would you predict to have the highest BP boiling point of these four? CO2, PF3, HF, CH4. Who do you guys, which one do you guys think will have the highest boiling point? Who would like to make that prediction? Who we got here? Uh, HF, exactly. Okay. Because HF has the strongest IMF interaction. So it would have the highest boiling point relative to the other four. Notice we didn't give absolute values. We're just making relative judgment here. And then the other question would be, well, if that's the case, if HF has the highest boiling point, okay, who would have the lowest one? And to answer that would be who's got the weakest. And it would be a toss up between CO2 and methane because they got the, 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 the weakest intermolecular force which leaves PF3 to have something in between, okay? All right. Exactly. iPhone is correct. And that's, that's what I read from my end, iPhone. All right, so that's how we do relative comparison. And I went just using the physical property of boiling point. Okay. We can we can extend that to melting point. That is the boiling point. That is the temperature. Let me state there. The boiling point is the temperature by at the temperature at which a compound goes from the liquid to the gas phase. Okay. Whereas the melting point is that temperature that a solid goes to the liquid phase. All right. So we just just determine who would have the highest boiling point, we can say the same thing for uh, uh, boiling point. But we're gonna talk about surface tension and some other vapor pressure and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. All right, any questions about this point? Okay. Um, here we, we, there's an equation here, it's called Coulomb's Law. All right, it's, it's a crazy equation here. You know, you look at this and the only thing I want you to take away from this equation is the following. 
that the interaction between molecules, between molecules, even think about this. If I, have, I don't have my magnets here, but normally if you take two magnets that attract each other, we all know that it, the closer they get together, you can feel that force. Okay, that force is is, is pretty strong. And then the closer we get, the stronger the force. Even if they repel, if we bring them together, the magnets, as they, if there's a part or certain amount, you can barely feel that that repulsion force. But as you bring them together, let's say two norths looking and feeling each other, you can start to pick up and feel that force of repulsion. Until such time you bring them to even closer together, that force gets stronger. And that's what Coulomb's law is saying here, that this interaction that we've got we're talking about is really proportional to the square of the radius, inversely proportional to the square radius of those two atoms. Now, kind of, let me do this. Here's the equation, okay? Let's simplify this. Let's, oh, let me change the color. Okay, let's take K as a constant, Q1 and Q2 just happens to be the charge of two species interacting with each other. Let's take those three variables and, and keep them, in, put them into one variable. I'm gonna call it X. So I'm gonna say uh, KE, Q1 and Q2 will be equal to X, okay? So we can simplify this and say the force is equal to X over R squared, because we're gonna keep X constant. You know, Q, Q1 and Q2 will be constant. K is already a constant. So we're just simplifying. So we're just gonna look at X over R2. All right, so let's let's take an example where uh, we, and, and R is the radius, the distance between two, entities brought to each other. And let's, for argument's sake, that R, that radius is equal to one unit, whatever one unit is, one nanometer, one meter, whatever, it's one unit, okay? And so this equation, we plug in one into, into this equation, we got F is equal to X over one square. Well, obviously one square is one. And so the force, at, the, at a radius of unit of one is equal to X, whatever X is, okay? And that'd be the charge so far. Now, let's do something interesting. Let's take R and let's just double where it was to begin with. It was at one, so let's double, let's double the distance between them. So we're at one unit, now we're at two units. And so this is example number one here. Example number two, now force is double, so it's force x divided by two square, which is one four, right? X over four, two square is four. And so just by doubling the distance, you have in effect decreased that force by a quarter, by a quarter, okay? And so that force is a lot, lot weaker. Okay, so um, what do we got here? Uh, check, check something. All right, now let's go the opposite direction. What we did in, in example number two was double the distance. Okay, let's go the other way. Let's reduce the distance by half. Okay, and so uh, example number three will be that the force now is equal to x over 0.5 square. Okay, 0.5 square. Well, if you think about that, you know, 0 0.5 square. Give me a second. A little girl just came by and gave me some tips. <laughs> 0 0.5 square is simply x over 0.25, right? And 
one. One divided by 0.25 should be four. And so what has happened is by reducing that distance to half from one to 0.5, you have in effect increased that force by a factor of four X. Okay, where, where and that's an example of three. So that's just telling you that the force between two entities is inversely proportional to the square of the radius between those two entities. And it makes sense if you think about those magnets, you know, as I take those magnets and I pull them apart from each other, pull them apart, that force is very minimal. But as I bring them together and the closer I get together, you can feel that force increase drastically, okay? In fact, it gets, uh, you can increase that force by a factor of four if you reduce that distance by half. Okay, so that's the takeaway from, from, from this equation, Coulomb's law, which is also related to, you know, the, our planets a little bit, kind of related to Newton's laws and so forth. But the point is, is, is simply just remember that, that the, um, that the two charges are proportional to the, the, the charge magnitude, which tells you that Q1 and Q2, obviously, if I increase the charge, I increase the force, directly proportional. But it's also inversely proportional to the distance squared between these two charges. And so if I move the distance, I double the distance away, I'm going to decrease the interaction. And as I bring the, the distance together closer, I drastically increase the interaction. That's the, the essence of that. All right, tell you what, let's take a quick 15 minute break. We'll come back and uh, finish this up here in a little bit. We finish this chapter. So I got uh, 114, let's come back 130, okay? All right, be right back. Let me... Okay, we're back now. All right, let us continue here. Now we have a table here. There's actually some questions, obviously. Now, in reading these questions, the thing to to make sure in reading these is that one, you have to discern: are they talking about intramolecular interactions or are they talking about inter? Okay, so you got to read the question carefully. So, first question in one says, what holds the atoms together in one ammonia molecule? And so they're talking about one ammonia molecule and what is holding the atoms within that one. So it obviously is the intramolecular force. So what type of bond is holding these? And we know it's a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, which is a covalent bond, specifically a polar covalent bond, okay? Now here, next way says, what is holding the sodium ion ions in water? Okay, so one, point number one, we're dealing with ionic compounds, a ion, and we're dealing with water. And so the only obvious choice here, hopefully you recognize that we're dealing with the ion dipole force, okay? Because we're dealing with an aqueous system and we're dealing with an ion. Third question, what is holding three HCl molecules together? Well, with that said, make sure I, okay. So with that said, key word here, three HCl molecules together. So we're talking about other molecules of HCl, which then it tells you we're dealing with intermolecular forces. Well, we need to figure out which one it is. Obviously, we can eliminate two things. Well, a couple, couple things before I proceed. Recognize here that we got a covalent bond, hydrogen chloride. 
further recognize that we got two different atoms which tell you that we have a polar bond, okay? We have a polar bond. So we can eliminate London forces, right? Because polar bonds don't, inter don't interact in that way. We can eliminate the ion dipole force, okay? Because we're not dealing with any ions. We're not dealing with any aqueous system. And so the only thing left is the dipole dipole and the hydrogen bridging force, okay? So dipole dipole, DD, or hydrogen bridging force, we are dealing with, remember, hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. I wish, yes, we got hydrogen here. Okay, that's important. We got hydrogen, but it's not nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. It is chloride. Therefore, the only choice we have is the dipole dipole. Okay, let me, re let me rehash what I just went through. I went through a systematic way to try to answer the question. Keyword three molecules that tells me intermolecular interactions. Okay, second. Uh, determine what type of molecule HCl is. Well, we got two different atoms there, so automatically should tell you dipole, uh, excuse me, polar molecule. Okay. Being polar, that eliminates the ion dipole force and eliminates the London dispersion forces. So the only two forces is dipole dipole or hydrogen bridging force. Okay. Can't be hydrogen bridging force because that only pertains to those molecules that have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluoride. In this case, it's bonded to chloride. So the only choice left is the dipole dipole. All right, so it's dipole dipole forces that hold three HCl molecules together, okay? Um, <clears throat> This one could be a little, next question could be a little tricky, but let's read the question carefully. It's asking, what is holding the ions together in salt, sodium chloride? Well, point number one, we're not dealing with any aqueous system. There's no mention of water. And so we're talking about sodium chloride in the solid form. That's it, okay? So sodium chloride, obviously not covalent bond. It's an ionic bond. So it is ionic bonds that are holding the sodium chloride salt together. Okay. Next one is what is holding four, notice that four, which tells you intermolecular forces. So it's either those four. There's no mention of ions in here. Okay, no mention of ions, so we can eliminate the ion dipole forces. Then the next thing is H2O. Now, you can just memorize in long-term memory that whenever you're dealing with H2O, you have the most polar molecule there is, okay? And so water is polar, no questions asked, that's it. So now you can eliminate London dispersion forces, you eliminated Ion, uh, ion um, dipole forces, because there's no mention here of ions. So the only force left over is either uh, dipole dipole or hydrogen bridging. Well, we got hydrogen bonded to oxygen, which tells us, yes, it's hydrogen bridging. Okay. Hydrogen bridging here. Now, I've been, I've been asked numerous times, well, wait a minute. A hydrogen oxygen, it's a dipole. Yes, it is a dipole. No questions asked about that. A bond between an oxygen and a hydrogen is a dipole bond, a polar bond, okay? And we could say it's a dipole-dipole interaction. However, because it's hydrogen specifically bonded to oxygen, it has that one of the little special cases, a little step up, okay? It's a step up, okay? It's a step up from a dipole dipole, so it's hydrogen bridging forces. Yeah. All right. Oh, it's, I got it. I jumped ahead. Well, there you go. Let's back, we'll work it backwards. Legend forces only pertains to nonpolar species. 
and nitrogen gas is dipolar. Nitrogen gas being dipolar, automatically all the dipole, all the, uh, excuse me, all the uh, diatomic molecules out there are nonpolar. Okay, and so once you've been once you've been classified as nonpolar, the only force involved there would be London forces. What is holding the oxygens together in oxygen gas molecule? Again, distinguish inter intra. Since we are talking about the oxygens within a molecule of oxygen, then we are dealing simply with what type of bond. Okay. And the type of bond involved here is simply a covalent bond, more specifically a nonpolar bond. I've been asked this. Well, can I just say covalent bond? Well, you'll be half correct because remember, uh, there are two types of covalent bonds. There's a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. So we have to be specific, okay? And then finally, what is holding two ammonia molecules together? So we are talking about two different ammonia molecules together. Okay, so it's intermolecular forces, intermolecular forces. So we need to determine, all right, what type of molecule is ammonia? And so we may have to figure out the structure for it. And using the Lewis class structure, we end up with that type of structure. We've done this one before. Okay, and if you recall that I said, anytime you see a lone pair of nitrogen uh, electrons in the central atom, Guess what? You are definitely dealing with a di a polar molecule. Okay, so we got a polar molecule there. Uh, and obviously, because the hydrogen and the nitrogen are different, it's polar bonds, and these polar bonds do not do not uh, 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 cancel each other out because of the lone pair. So we have a lone polar molecule. So we don't deal with London forces. We're not dealing with ion dipole here because there's no mention of ions. So that leaves us with dipole dipole or hydrogen bridging. It's got to be hydrogen bridging. Why? Because we see nitrogen here bonded to, excuse me, hydrogen bonded to nitrogen. And so the only choice we have is hydrogen bridging force. Okay? Hydrogen bridging force. All right. So that's typical type of questions that we get from their ass. And the, the key point, the main takeaway here is when you answer the questions, um, you know, read the question carefully, okay? Read it carefully. All right, so to kind of summarize this IMF forces, is we've got this uh, flow chart, kind of kind of a little bit of a crooked flow chart. But again, uh, if it's a covalent compound, we first distinguish between nonpolar and polar. Okay, step number one. If it is nonpolar, automatically you don't have to go any further. The only force involved there is London forces. Okay. If it is, if it's a polar molecule, okay. You have to determine whether it is a, a di dipole dipole hydrogen bridging or ion dipole. If, if, it's, if it's a polar molecule, okay, which if it's ionic, it's going to be polar in itself already, okay. And I kind of put it underneath the polar category because we're dealing with a dipole, which is normally H2O. And so we're dealing with an ionic compound and water and so automatically you've got a ion dipole interaction okay uh, the other two choices recall that the only if it's hydrogen and that's specific it's got to be hydrogen bonded to be the nitrogen oxygen or fluoride for it to be a hydrogen bridging if it's not under any of those three uh examples then the only choice you have is a dipole dipole intermolecular force okay with respect to strength, hydrogen bridging is number one, uh, London force is number three, dipole dipole is number two, as far as strength is concerned. Though they're not as strong as an actual bond, but within those two forces, that's the order of strength, which then would allow us to do a relative comparison 
by some physical properties when we, when we compare molecules with each other. Okay? And what these physical properties we're going to work with are uh, vapor pressure, okay? Uh, boiling point, which we have talked about already, and then a surface tension, and then viscosity, okay? Now, keep this in mind. All these physical properties here, these four physical properties, is uh, they are affected by the strength by which the molecules are held onto each other, okay? And I've already introduced that concept when we talk about the boiling point. If the molecules are held onto each other stronger relative to another system, then the boiling point, you would expect the boiling point to be greater because it would take more energy to break up that interaction. Okay. And that will be true for vapor pressure, boiling point, and, you know, and surface tension and viscosity. The strength and the amount of energy it takes to hold these molecules together will affect these physical properties. Okay, now let's talk about vapor pressure. All right, well, best way to describe this is, uh, is excuse me. This best way to describe this is let's take a soda pop container. All right, so I'm going to draw a container of some volatile. Bear with me, I'm not an artist, okay? So this guy, here's soda pop, and we got it capped up, right? And here's the liquid here. Now, you, we all know that it's under pressure here, right? So we got the liquid sitting here in the bottom, and then up in here is the gas phase. Now, if I was to put a gauge on the area that's, you know, just air, I can actually measure a pressure in there, okay? Now, granted, if you know this, if you take a soda pop and you shake it up, what happens? And it's closed up, that soda pop bubbles up into that area. And if we had a meter, guess what? That pressure would go up, the vapor pressure would go up. We also know if we let that bottle sit there, it would equilibrate back into wherever the state it began with and the vapor pressure drops, okay? so. The vapor pressure is a measure of how, how many molecules are in the gas phase. And obviously, the more molecules in the gas phase relative to the liquid phase, we've got the gas from here. Okay. The more molecules in the gas phase, the higher the vapor pressure. Now, as we talked about, this, these molecules that are in the liquid phase, if they are held close together to each other, they held on tightly. Guess what? There's going to be less molecules going in the gas phase. You know, it makes sense then when you think about it. All right? It's just sitting there minding its own business. You know, it's going to take, it'll take, uh, if they're held on in the liquid phase relative to each other strongly, it's going to take energy to kick them into the vapor phase. Okay? All right. And so if the, I, if the IMF interaction is strong, Vapor pressure, guess what? Drops, right? Vapor pressure drops because there's there's not enough molecules in the gas phase. All right. Enough of that. Let's go on. We're, we're talking about uh, we're talking about the uh, uh, liquid going from the solid to the liquid phase into the gas phase. And obviously, you know, if we cap it, it's going to reach a state of equilibrium like I was drawing that picture there. And we all know that that uh, if we take that cap off, we, that soda pop, for example, loses fizz, right? Because all that carbonation evaporates and gets in the atmosphere and, and we no longer have that fizz, it gets a little flat. On the same token, if you were to take a container of liquid, any liquid, and just leave it on the kitchen table, some water, leave it on the kitchen table for about a week. When you come back, eventually that liquid's going to evaporate. Because even without hitting it with, with heat and energy, the fact that these molecules are moving around a lot to each other, some of them bump into each other and they get kicked off and get into the atmosphere. And that process continues over time. If, that, if you have no lid on that container, 
that whole liquid evaporates, okay, with time. All right, so uh, pressure develops if we've got a lid. Now, vapor pressure is a pressure exerted by gas molecules, okay? The more gas molecules we have in the vapor phase, the higher the pressure. So, question is if I have a stronger IMF, would my vapor pressure be higher or lower? And the answer is lower. The stronger the IMF, the less likelihood the molecules go up into the vapor phase because they're being held together more tightly in the liquid phase. Okay. And so, this, this, uh, uh, diagram here kind of yes. the question may be asked, which has a weaker IMF, A or B? Okay. And we can say that A does, right? Because there are more gas molecules denoted by the spheres in the vapor phase right here. Compared to B, which only has, depicts only three of them, okay? And so that means that the interaction here, the interaction between the IRF interaction for A is weaker compared to B because in B they're being held on tighter and it takes more energy. Can I get more molecules for B into the air? Yes, but I got to put energy into the system. So I'm talking about just comparing them at the same temperature. And A is, has a, uh, is a weaker IMF. Who will have the higher VP? Obviously here, A, why? Because there are more molecules in the gas phase. More molecules in the, in the gas phase, the higher the pressure, okay? Think of it in terms like you're putting air in your tire. You got a low tire, you know, you're, you're operating at 25 PSI, what do you do? You go to a quick trip, fill up with air, you're putting more air molecules into your tire, pressure goes up, okay? All right. All right, let's, let's talk about the boiling point. The boiling point is the temperature when the liquid goes from, from uh, <laughs> chemical goes from liquid to gas. That's the phase change, right? So a strong high map, would give you a higher boiling point, okay? Because the same reason again, the stronger high map, the stronger the interaction between the molecules, the more energy I need to hit it with, to inject it with, to get it to boil, because it takes more energy to break, break that up. And that's why some things are very volatile. For example, uh, water, let's say water versus acetone. You might be familiar with acetone. Uh, acetone is used a lot in uh, nail polish remover. It's very volatile. You take the cap off and you just, you can smell it. And if you left that cap off, if I have two amounts of acetone, liquid or nail polish remover, and a container, same amount of water, and then left it on cap, you see that the acetone will evaporate much quicker. The container will be emptier much quicker than the one with water. Again, you can infer that the interaction, the intermolecular forces for the acetone, nail polish are much weaker than it is for water. Okay, being weaker doesn't take as much energy to get those to go into the vacuum to get into the atmosphere. Okay? All right. So surface tension, uh, before I forget, the strong IMF also means that the melting point, very similar to the boiling point, would be relatively high for the same reason. All right, surface tension. This is, this is the, a measure of how molecules hold on to each other affects the surface tension. Uh, another way to look at surface tension is how water or liquids can beat up on the surface. You know, you've seen, you may have seen, maybe not, you, know, you wax your car up, you throw some water in it, it beads up. It's nice and waxed and clean. When it's not, the water flattens out. Well, that's the interaction between the surface and the liquid. But in itself, okay, 
the measure of how, you know, comparing two different liquids on a constant surface, some liquids will bead up much more than other liquids. Again, related to the uh, IMF interaction. Here in this example, A, the molecules of A hold on to each other much stronger than B, therefore resulting in a more of a bead, if you will, than compared to uh, uh, example number B. Okay. Again, due to the uh, IMF interactions. All right, now viscosity. Viscosity we're, we should be familiar with too. Viscosity is a measure of what is the resistance to flow. Things don't, you know, resist flow. So that being the case, some things are very viscous. Classic example would be honey and water. If we were to take a cup of honey and a cup of water and same amount and just have a race and see which one empties out and take the cups and flip them over, obviously the water is going to win the race, right? And because water is a lot less viscous than the honey. And the honey molecules, that infers that the intermolecular forces of the water versus the honey molecules are stronger for the honey than it is for the water because they hold on to each other much greater. Now, how can we make the honey become more flowable? What do we do? We heat it up, right? If we were to heat up the honey, it's going to flow a lot more because you're breaking up that interaction again making it flow as much as it has even at the viscosity of say water okay uh, oil obviously flows slowly again it depends on the viscosity some oils are very viscous some are a lot thick okay vodka for example uh, flows rapidly because of low viscosity so in this case you know uh, which one would have the higher IMF well, the higher AMF in this case would be the oil, okay? Because again, they are, are holding the molecules together much stronger than let's say in this case, the alcohol. All right, so let's do a comparison, okay? A relative comparison. We can't give absolute values, but we can do a compare and contrast and say, okay, this one's gonna have higher so-and-so, higher viscosity than this one. So the first thing is to give you the, the compounds. And what you got to do first is to know the structure. Because from the structure, you're going to know whether this molecule is polar or no. Okay. Now, we have at length, we have talked about ammonia quite a bit. But to refresh your memory, we use the lowest dot structures. We come up with this species right here, the structure. And what this tells us is this is very polar. Okay, okay. And what else do we know we can figure out here is being polar, that means that it's either either going to be a dipole dipole or hydrogen bridge. Well, it turns out that it is hydrogen bridging, right? Of course, it's involved for this molecule because we've got nitrogen bonded to hydrogen. Okay. Uh, we look at fluorine, fluorine is diatomic. Okay. Being diatomic, Automatically, we know that this is non-polar. Okay, and the only force involved for non-polar species would be the London dispersion forces. Okay, so to answer any of these questions that maybe do a compare and contrast between two molecules, the first thing we need to do is determine the polarity of the molecule, which then in turn tells us the IMF for that particular molecule. Once you know what IMF, we know the strength. So this is stronger than the L did. So this is the weaker IMF. So once we know that, which is stronger, which is weaker, now we can do a compare and contrast. Okay. And so there's a formula, and we just determined that uh, ammonia is has a hydrogen bridging force and uh, uh, fluorine has the London forces. Okay, so questions that may be asked, and let me clear this up a little bit, would be, 
All right, which has the stronger IMF? Well, obviously the hydrogen bridging force, which means ammonia has the stronger IMF, okay? They could have asked which has the weaker IMF, okay? So that would be chlorine, okay? Which has the lower boiling point? Lower boiling point would mean the weaker IMF. So that means that chlorine would have the lower boiling point. Okay. They could have asked which has the higher boiling point. Here were these questions. It could be asked one way or the other. Which is polar? We did talk about this. We've we've determined that ammonia is polar. Okay. Where uh, fluorine is in ampoule. Which has a higher vapor pressure. Well, the higher vapor pressure tells you that in the closed container, there'll be more molecules in the gas phase, which is a result of weaker forces, weaker forces, okay? So in this case, um, fluorine would have the higher vapor pressure. Okay, now, which is the least viscous? Now, question number four, they could have been, could have asked which has the lower vapor pressure? Okay, you can reverse the question. Uh, number five, which is the least viscous, okay? And these were both liquids and we can compare. And here we would say that fluorine would be the least viscous, simply again, because they have the weaker IMF interacting. And then more surface tension, that would be ammonia because it has the higher, or the stronger uh, IMF interaction, intermolecular force. Okay, so to kind of help you out, you can say is at the IMF increases, as we increase the IMF, the viscosity goes up, okay? So the IMF gets stronger, this guy makes the, makes the material more viscous, more honey-like, if you will, okay? Which means that the boiling point is, is higher, increases because it takes more energy to break up that interaction, okay? The surface tension also goes up, all right? So keep this in mind. As the IMF increases, gets stronger, viscosity, boiling point, surface tension, they proportionally increase too, okay? The only physical property that decreases is the vapor pressure. Again, why? Because the vapor pressure gets much less, simply because the molecules are being held together much tighter in the liquid phase, okay? Then, then uh, yeah, they're held up much, much tighter in the liquid phase. In fact, if you look at the vapor pressure of solids, you almost non-existent, okay? There are some solids that do have some vapor pressure. Uh, they go directly from solid to gas phase, but uh, you know the molecules are being held on closely together. They're not going to be released into the vapor pressure into the vapor phase as readily. Um, a couple of things about water, kind of kind of unique aspect about water. Uh, in which we we did talk about, we did do the the Lewis dot structures of water, we determined that there are two lone, two bonding electron pairs that bonded to the hydrogen. Uh, it is two non, and then there were two non-bonding electron pairs. Uh, it, we also determined they had a bent molecular geometry with a bond angle much, much less than 109.5, which is the standard bond angle. The, no, I say standard, the, the, the uh, bond angle, uh, uh, I'm trying to make sure I pick my words correctly. The, the most common bond angle is 109.5. And the reason it's much less is because those lone pairs take up a lot more space, causing that bond angle between the two hydrogens to, to get much smaller, okay? Water is extremely, extremely polar, most polar chemical that we have. It will dissolve, it will dissolve many ionic compounds. Even those kionic compounds that are labeled as insoluble, remember the solubility rules? Okay, 
even those guys, water will dissolve them. It will dissolve a small portion. You know, solubility is a relative thing. It's either 100% or it could be maybe 5 2%, but water will eventually dissolve everything. And being polar, it will dissolve any other polar species. So light dissolves like, remember that. So something that has a lot of polar character will dissolve in water. A good classic example, alcohol, which is really, if you think about it, alcohol has a nonpolar part and a polar part. But water will interact with the polar part of alcohol. Okay? And you know, what do I mean by that? Somebody asked me a while back, well, I don't know, what do you mean alcohol has a polar part and a nonpolar part? A lot of molecules have them. I wish it was straightforward. While well, this molecule is 100% polar and 100% nonpolar, it's not always the case. Sometimes molecules have characteristics of both. And this is the structure of uh, ethanol, which is a common alcohol. Okay, It has an OH group to it. And then we have a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds, which if you recall, we talked about that. You know, that this area I'm going to denote with white here is the nonpolar part. This is the nonpolar part because there's nothing but carbon and hydrogen, which is nonpolar bonds. But we have a carbon oxygen bond, which makes it a polar bond. Okay, so this, this uh, ethanol has nonpolar characters, characteristics and polar characteristics. It is soluble in water. We know that alcohol and water are soluble in water. Okay. All right. Uh, a lot of detergents and soaps have a nonpolar group and a polar group. You know, the nonpolar part will dissolve the oil and greases, and the polar group part will be uh, be dissolved in uh, water. That's why you're able to wash stuff. Okay. All right. Let me continue. So water has very strong hydrogen breaking forces between the molecules. Very, very strong. Water is extremely unique. Some properties of water are very poor as I stated, has a very high IMF, okay? Low vapor pressure. Its boiling point is high, relative to 100 degrees Celsius, and melting point zero. Very high surface tension and something unique about water for some reason compared to other uh, liquid to other compounds is that when water freezes, it literally expands. Which if you ever live in cold country, you, you got freezing temperatures out there, you gotta worry about your water pipes freezing and then expanding and breaking. And you won't know that they broke until the water falls and then you got a big deal. All right, very unique property. Uh, here's some structures of uh, water, crystal structure, of water on the, on the left hand side. And then supposedly snowflakes are all you know, also different, different structures. Everything is unique about a snowflake. That's, that's what I'm told. I'm not 100% sure on that. All right, let's talk about heating curves. Okay, and, and how intramolecular forces come into play here. Okay, we have here a typical heating curve. Basically, what that is is this we have a graph which we have temperature on the, on the uh, y axis over here, and then on the x axis, we have amounts of heat added. Okay, so you can see that we have no zero, zero temperature, if you will, no heat. You know, we are in, if we can use this as water, as water we can solve. Okay, we got ice cubes sitting here, okay? So we begin to heat an ice cube, okay? And as we add heat to the system, obviously our temperature goes up, right? We're adding heat to the system. Now, so along this line here, we have, um, a, a solid material, it's still solid. This could be water, but it could be anything. So it's frozen solid. Then what happens, 
Notice something. We hit a plateau went from right here to right here. We continue to give it energy, but the temperature is constant on this plateau. And in this plateau, we have a, a mixture of solid and liquid on the plateau. But notice we keep adding, we keep adding um, energy, but the temperature doesn't go up. Okay, it stays at a plateau. Then we reach a point where the temperature goes up again. And here, that's when all of the solid has been converted to liquid. So you've got nothing but liquid as, we temp as it goes up. And guess what? We hit another plateau, which again would be some temperature right here, whatever temperature that would be, depends on the material. But we have a plateau. Again, the temperature is constant. Okay? And at that, that plateau, we have a mixture of liquid and gas on the plateau. Until such time that all the liquid has been converted to gas, and then we have another increase of temperature. Okay? So we have two plateaus here as we are taking all the, going to all the physical states of matter. They okay, go from solid to liquid to gas. And then in between, we have a mixture of solid and liquid on the plateau and liquid and gas on the second plateau. So, all right, so let's, let's take, this could be again water. And so over here, oh, This could be uh, zero degrees. This could be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. And so again, we have ice, everything's solid. And at that first plateau, let me change the So on that first plateau, the temperature doesn't increase. It stays at zero. What we, in effect, are doing is you know, we have the molecules of, of uh, water all in the, in the solid form. We're breaking those up. We're breaking that interaction, the IMF. All that energy is being used to break up that interaction between the solid water molecules, okay? And so it's until such time that all of that solid has been converted to liquid and then temperature goes up again until we hit another plateau. And over here now we have, you know, liquid and then kind of make a nestle order. And we're breaking up that interaction where we're shoving that liquid molecules into the gas, into the gas phase and another chemical increase. But the point is this, you know, as a little side note, so the next time you're boiling water to make some spaghetti and your water's boiling, some people feel that, well, if I turn the temperature up, I'm going to get it to boil a lot hotter. It's not going to happen. Okay. Not until all that water, liquid water, has been converted to, uh, liquid, uh, to gas. So your temperature is constant. You have a thermometer at home, try this at home with boiling water. It stays constant the whole time. So save your energy, save some money. Don't kick it up. It's not going to, you're not going to make things go any faster. All right. And so at this point, at the plateaus, at the plateaus, we are using all that energy is being absorbed into the system is being utilized to break up the IMF interaction, kick it back in, kick it into the next uh, physical state. Okay, and now actually that plateau is really a function of of, uh, of uh, how much material. So it can take a lot more energy to say boil a little one quart bottle uh, quart of water and say, you know, maybe a hundred quarts of water to get that thing to boil. All that energy, it's gonna take a lot of energy, okay? Because there's a lot, of, a lot of molecules in there, okay? Yeah, so you hit a plateau on there. So what, what we get during these phase changes is this the temperature remains constant. You can see that based on the graph. The energy goes into breaking the IMF. 
Now, keep in mind, I didn't say break the bonds. It takes a lot more, more energy to break the bonds. It's just breaking the IMF interactions, okay? And uh, you are breaking the IMF interaction. You're not breaking bonds. So you're being correct to say that you're breaking bonds on the plateaus of any typical heating graph, okay? That being said, congratulations. We are done with chapter 14. We're just sipping along here. All right. Let me.